Hello, and welcome to Friends for Life, a podcast of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod's National Mission. We're here to come alongside you as we journey through life under the cross. What does it look like to care for our neighbors in body and soul? How do we tend to our own body and soul? How can we speak up for life? And finally, how do we share the faith with the next generation? Join us as we have these conversations and learn together. We hope you'll stick around and be our friends for life. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm your host, Steph Nugebauer, here with my guest for the next two episodes, Pastor Brian Barlow. In this episode, Pastor and I will spend time talking about homosexuality, living within the gay community, and ultimately where Christians find their identity. We'll also get to hear a very personal story of radical transformation by the power of the Spirit. Pastor, welcome. Would you please introduce yourself? And then we're going to dive right in. Okay. Well, thank you, Stephanie. It's a great pleasure to be here today and just talking with you. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. I am a Midwest-born farm kid. That's where I grew up. I grew up in Illinois on a farm. Uh, One of four boys in a family that um, was hardworking uh, and uh, really they loved the Lord. My dad was a Sunday school superintendent. Uh, My mom was a treasurer. So we were really active in the church when we were growing up. Uh, but you know, when you grow up, um, in, uh, the best of homes, uh, there's always some things that, uh, because of our fallen nature, aren't always perfect. And though we had a really safe home and, um, loving parents, uh, that did their best to raise us with love for God and, and care for our community and, and fellow man, as I grew up, I was the third, or four boys and just had a sense of insecurity that was kind of birthed out of just my temperament, I think, and my perceptions of life. And so as I can, you know, look at my life now as an adult, uh, I have a language for how I felt then. Uh, When I was growing up, I didn't truly know how to communicate as well. My brothers were kind of rough and tumble. They were farm kids. So they you know, we're really into the outdoors. I was an artist by nature. So I liked to draw and I was contemplative and um, I loved people, but I was more, you know, I could create um, art out of junk. And that was just kind of my thing. And um, I wasn't the youngest child and I wasn't the firstborn. I was just your classic middle child. And along about the time that I hit you know, grade school, I started to uh, recognize that uh, I didn't fit in. I didn't connect with my peers like I thought I you know, should. Uh, and uh, that was a really difficult time for me. When I was seven years old, I remember sitting in a Bible study with a pastor's wife. And it was it was our Sunday school um, curriculum. And they talked about um, faith in the life of Christ. And she talked about repentance. I just remember that so clearly because... I was um, to the dentist the week before and the dentist scolded me for being too old for sucking my thumb. And I was just insecure. That was just kind of my thing, you know? And so up until that point, I knew that it was wrong. Um, And my folks had um, done everything they could, my grandparents, to get me to stop sucking my thumb. And back then, they even had like these metal cages they put on your thumb. Oh, wow. And it was like a torture device. (laughs) And they put hot sauce, they tie strings on, whatever they could. I would just suck it off. You know, it didn't really um, do anything for me. But when she talked about repentance, this whole understanding of the gospel really kind of came to life for me. And that um, it's a it's a turning away, and it's and it's a reconciliation. I knew I had to give up my thumb for Jesus. <laughs> and as innocent as it was, it was the object lesson that God would give me at such a young age Hmm. to know that I was his because he knew the days to come uh, would be full of trouble. They wouldn't be as clear. And I needed to know that I was his. And I just remember going to bed that night, praying and putting my thumb under my pillow. And I never sucked again. And it found me, but nobody seemed to notice. (laughs) And as I grew up, I would, later go on to uh, a Christian university in the Midwest. It was a private um, university the south, south side of Chicago. It was wonderful. And I got close to graduation. 
when I got close to graduation, I started to uh, realize that in my person, in my, uh, in my masculinity, I started to recognize some deficits. And that which I didn't think I was or had in terms of what it meant to be male, fully male, um, I started to covet in other guys. And, and that um, really became uh, scary and confusing because it turned in my mind and in my heart such this attraction. I didn't understand. I didn't know how to unpack it. I knew that it wasn't God's plan for my life. And so I went to what I was told was a Christian counselor. I went to another Christian university in Chicago, counseling department, and I, for the first time, started sharing these feelings. And these emotions. I wasn't looking for anyone to validate those, saying that you know, it's okay and I should embrace it, or anything like that. I was really just looking for someone who uh, had the same um, theology as I did that God had created us for more. I was I'm created um, for life as God intended in Scripture, to, you know, to be married, have a family, all those things, and um, be in right relationship with, with females. But after four months of sitting and pouring out my heart, and it was really cathartic, it was really good, he looked at me and he said, you know, maybe for you, you should go to the gay bars in Chicago. That might be how God created you. Maybe you just need to go to Florida and, and learn that. And, you know, Stephanie, I was just devastated. My, my faith just hit a wall. 21 years of age, uh, graduating from a Christian university, uh, you know, having spent time on uh, summer mission um, experiences with the church. And now all of a sudden someone's saying that for me, uh, this is as good as it gets. And it was so contradictory to what I knew in my heart. But in that devastation, in that uh, emotional immaturity, uh, I took his ill advice and I went into those streets of Chicago. And, um, and it was uh, more disfiguring and disorienting than I've ever experienced prior to that. And what was even more um, conflicting for me was my, uh, my core theology. And I didn't understand it. I didn't have those, that language for it. But I just remember in that community, in those life experiences, engaging with those other males, this a uh, major accusation that came against me that I had no resolve for. And it was, how could I, as a baptized believer in Christ, do this? As a Christian, how could I do this? And I didn't have any answers for that. I would learn later that I had grown up intellectually, I'd grown up physically, but there were certain things in my early years in life that, um, stunted my emotional maturity, my relational wholeness. And those kinds of ungodly beliefs that I had about myself in relationship to God and others uh, created um, a deficit in my person so that when I looked at others, I, I didn't see things accurately. And I certainly didn't understand this, um, this reality of who um, I was in Christ in the fullness of my identity being um, brought to life out of the grave um, into wholeness. And what did that look like in light of sinful man and, and relationships? And so uh, fortunately, God didn't leave me there. Uh, in, that, um, in that devastation, he heard my cries. He knew that um, I was his. I doubted those kinds of things. And he led me to a ministry, oddly enough, near that same university in Chicago, uh, but a different, healthier Christian community that actually had language and understanding for me. And we had small groups. And I was able to um, get involved with that. And for the first time here, that the reason that you struggle is because that's not God's intent. And for the baptized believer, the, uh, the new creation, you're going to struggle because God has given you the awareness of the Holy Spirit heart and mind to know what sin looks like and this is outside of that intent for your life and so 
that was life-giving for me. A lot of the other stuff that they talked about um, in my year early years were uh, like sitting in a theology class in seminary at five years old. You, you heard these like, beautiful truths from these uh, well-educated people, uh, and yet you didn't have a place for it. It was just like, wow. So my journey from that continued for several years. And um, I would find myself out in California, fast forward all these years later, um, at a little Lutheran church in Palm Springs, California. And um, that was um, a real surprise to me because uh, I didn't grow up in the Lutheran church. And yet I had this, um, this art gallery in Palm Springs. I was going to sell enough art to get out of Dodge because nobody, and certainly God would not want me to be in Palm Springs, California. Because right now, 65% it's told um, of the population self-identify. It might be higher today as homosexual. And their latest bragging right was everybody on their city government was LGBTQ. So it's a very hostile environment for Christianity. And a lot of the churches struggle with how do we connect with this um, community? How do we love them? How do we tell them truth and not offend them and ostracize them? It can get really sticky and messy and unclear. Uh, but for me, that particular point in my life, the uh, Lutheran Church Missouri Synod there in Palm Springs, California, became clearer and pure. And the waters that I stepped into there, I had no idea what the Lord would do in exposing some of those areas that He wanted to do uh, a deeper work. In. You know, by that time, I had stepped out of the gay culture in one sense it was kind of like that movie as good as it gets you know you walk out and you realize okay this is as good as it gets you know um i'm just gonna live a celibate life i'm going to paint for jesus i'm gonna attend church you know and that's where i would be because most of it um, for me um i didn't have a place of the impossible you know I would, I would later rest on an uh, the the words of Ephesians three twenty that he will do exceedingly more than you can ever imagine unimaginable things and the, the those things would come to life for me and how that happened was as I was there um, the church I don't think they uh, sat down and thought oh wow this guy's got problems we've got to come up with a kind of a spiritual education plan for this person <laughs> you know and re we got to integrate them, you know. Um, but in one sense, while it may not have been a formal intent, this church did. They noticed me. Um, you know, when you live a life like I had lived, uh, with all of the um, disintegrating kinds of things that come against your soul, you bear the mark of that sin. And yet, um, God's desire is to uh, reconcile, restore, and bring you out of that, but you still kind of carry that. So the folks would, you know, I'm sure they knew that the single man uh, attending there had some issues, uh, but they didn't look at me in that regard. They, you know, they looked, I believe, uh, in my assessment, at the truth of what scripture says. They saw me um, as a whole enough engendered person, as a male, called by God for greater things. So they treated me like a male. They got involved. They um, bought art from my gallery. To this day, they're one of the biggest curators of my art. <laughs> you know, it's often they kept me in business. And all through the time, while they supported me as a person and my livelihood, I got to get integrated into that community. And they got to know my story. And at that point, I thought this is as good as it gets. They took an interest in and discipled me and, and invested in me and opened up space in the church for a front porch ministry. And that was for any of the people in the community that came to them that struggled as I did with the same gender attraction, they would make space for um, a gospel conversation. And so we were, we started a ministry called CARE. And um, and in that ministry, uh, I would bring you know, curriculum 
and uh, conversation, dialogue, and prayer uh, with strugglers. And then it kind of turned into uh, married couples that had a heart to love these folks to life. So they started coming. It was a really interesting dynamic. Throughout this whole time, the Lord was stirring up in my heart the desires that he placed in me when he created me. And the uh, church secretary, beautiful woman, would always be the one who would volunteer for every outreach thing that we would do. You know, if there was something that she could bake, she'd bake it, you know, and she'd show up. And the, the pastors and counselors, uh, they were attending and they were watching our relationships and stuff, you know, all the people in the church. And, and every once in a while, the counselor would say, you know, what is it going Nicole, and I'd like, she's cool, <laughs> you know, but I still had that block in my life. I still had that, that I'm damaged goods kind of thought, and who would want this? But there was this, uh, there's a, 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 a process the Lord took me through to show me uh, the true, beautiful transformation that he does in everyone who has been taken from the grave. He removes their grave clothes. He removes the statue of death. He clothes them in white and he prepares them for a marriage feast. And he did that in such an amazing way. Um, by nature, I can be a little bit skeptical. And having gone through some of the things I've gone through, it, it's just it'd be easy. Like, oh, well, we'll see if this is very real. But um, there's a series of moments, and it became very clear to me that this relationship with Nicole was meant for more. And she's a very courageous, beautiful person. And she wasn't looking for a charity case. She had all kinds of options. Like this wasn't like, oh, we're going to help this poor guy into wholeness. She said to me later that she trusted Jesus in me because she watched my life. And that I and this 94-year-old man was some of her favorite <laughs> people that walked in the office. <laughs> I uh, um, just always was just this sweet little old 94 year old man always writing poems. And she said, and you came in and you were just funny. And I just, you know, but she saw Christ in me and we met and there at that church and we married in 2012. And it was, it, you know, it, this the whole church celebrated because they've been praying for 20 years for the sexually broken in oh, the wow. community of Palm Springs. And it was the last wedding that this pastor, after ministering there for 45 years, did. And it was remarkable. And the fruit of that is um, 11 years later, we just celebrated the birth of our fourth son. So one of four boys now has, as the dad of four boys. <laughs> and, you know, you know I, I'm, I'm careful when I share all this because I don't want people to think that this is the litmus test of healing and whole in Christ. Um, God has a, a story and a plan to his glory for everybody. And they all have a different journey. And I wouldn't want someone to think that because they didn't get married and they didn't have children, that somehow their healing, what God has done doing in their life is less than. But I do know this, that every morning I wake up at four o'clock and hold our new son, Dylan, that I'm living a miracle. And it wasn't because of anything that I could possibly do in my own strength, in my own striving, in my own thinking. It was something God did in and through my life. And for that, I thank him for the years of struggle. I still have struggles, but not in that context. Now it's like, you know, fast track to learn how to be a good husband, you know, die to myself daily, you know, build up my wife, then my four boys. How do I lead them to be godly men? And some days it's just wonderful. Some days I'm like, Lord, I'm struggling and I need your belief in me. Just like when Nicole said one time, a gal came up to her and she says, aren't you like worried about Brian? You know, cause you know, and, and so she's like, well, you know, that doesn't occur to me because I don't trust Brian. I trust Jesus in Brian. And my hope and my strength comes from something that transcends a life that may have um, had some bumps in the road. 
And to me, whenever she says that, it's so life-giving. It, it reminds me, uh, though I am weak, the strength that by all miracles that people see in my life, in my story, isn't manufactured mm -hmm. by me. It's truly this living God that has the ability to save and set free his blood. Pastor, I have I have so many questions, and I have to be honest. This is a, you know, this is a topic that we we can't possibly touch every facet of it in the time that that we have. But what we are trying to do is to do our best to tell your story and to share your wisdom for others. And so, with this topic, especially of a, a life in the gay community and homosexuality, where do Christians? begin? I mean, where where is a good starting point for understanding this rightly? When we talked about life according to God's design, what role does sexuality play in our identity? Is it your sexuality? Is it who you're attracted to? Is it who you desire to be? Or is it more than that? Well, for a long time, I thought it was who I was attracted to. And that scared me. Uh, prior to um, those um, those experiences in the gay community, I would have um, defended myself in my identity with um, kind of behavioral kind of responses, like, well, I don't do those things, you know, so I'm not that, you know. And I know that we live in a very confusing world today that says if you have the appetite for it, then you should do that appetite, and that's who you're created to be. In Christ, we recognize that that's, that's a lie, and that's not how you live a whole enough um, life um, in, in gendered. For me, what I recognized um, in my healing journey is that my identity um, was wrapped up prior to my sexual feelings and, and how I, I kind of identified myself um, with my relationships that I had. And so I just learned through mirroring others and parroting others and those kinds of things. When I wasn't able to uh, really identify or connect with the masculine in my others, then I felt a deficit and those kinds of things kind of went internal. And so I didn't know until later that those were more emotional deficits. And uh, one of the things that I recognize as a, a, a baptized believer in Christ now is that my identity that transcends this, um, this um, struggle is in who God says I am and the promises that he completes, the one who's faithful to the faithless. And so for me, that journey uh, was really clarifying. Uh, I'll tell you, um, the, the thing that uh, was really profound to me is when I recognized some of the, um, the ungodly beliefs that I had growing up about gender and sexuality. And part of that was recognizing that um, God made me from birth completely male. Like there was no deficits there. He made me completely male. My uh, my person, my biology, everything that he sewn into me was male. And he made others female. And so regardless of my feelings or my appetites, that was truth. He created me in his likeness, in his image. As I grew up with some of the um, experience that I had, um, I recognize that pieces of that truth I uh, were distorted by maybe comments that people made, people that picked on me and they, they called me names and called me gay and called me um, some of those other really derogatory um, words that um, oftentimes are delivered in a public venue. So the public humiliation made it even more difficult for me to sort out. And my behavior was the only thing I could use as a defense when they would make those public um, declarations. And it would be like, well, I don't, now that I know what that is, I don't do that. When I um, did do that after that poor advice from that counselor, then that went away. And then I was left with, well, who am I really? What is true masculinity? What is godly masculinity? And our culture today has distorted that and really disintegrated that in a, a traumatic way for our kids today. You know, with the whole idea that um, nothing by design is created whole, that it's just something that you're just gonna figure out 
on life. And like I, you know, bounce up against whatever people's impressions and stuff were. So when I started to understand that God had given me identity, created me in likeness and image to him, he gave me form. And because he gave me form, he gave me function. Then I started to realize the gift of the other. And this was a real profound thing for me. I have to say, because, you know, uh, there's all kinds of really messed up messages that we get uh, if we don't feel like we're fully male or, or something's wrong or we're, we've got a problem. Uh, in our relationship, the bigger, the bigger conversation, I think, um, for anyone who struggles with gender identity or sexuality is what is their relationship with the other, their complement, the female, the male, the, you know, that's the bigger thing because it exposes a whole host of problems and ungodly beliefs that a person can create and decisions that they make, um, some from very early ages, and they can start to um, cut off that identity by rejecting it and not even know what they're doing. And that was the case with me. I was just, you know, well, this, this isn't it. So um, I'm less of a person and, and until it was all redone. And I remember uh, going into marriage with Nicole and thinking, well, you know, I'm going to do this pretty well. God can transform me out of this and take away that, um, that power, those unbridled passions. Then I'm going to be the best husband and father known to man. <laughs> and, you know, um, I even had this, this really twisted belief that I kind of got girls a little bit better, you know, because I came out of that thing. So I just kind of got you, you know. And I remember sitting in the living room. Nicole was pregnant with our first son. And she was talking to me and her, she was just like talking and talking and talking. I just remember looking at her thinking, I don't understand the words you're saying. And I'm thinking in my mind. And in that same moment, it's like, I had this like aha moment. I go, I don't understand a word she's saying. That's because I'm not a girl. I'll never be a girl. I'm a guy. I'll always be a guy. I was creating it. It was just grounding. It was just life giving to me. Life giving me that I don't talk girl, you know? And I remember I was in a counselor's office once and um, he was saying, he was talking about marriage and things like that. He said, you know, you, you really don't understand women, do you? And I go, no, <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> Nicole's probably like, I, well, I wish he understood me a little bit more. <laughs> I know, right, right, right. You know, it's so like, so I explained that whole epiphany and he goes, wow, that's, I, I can see what you're saying. <laughs> but as I've grown in a relationship with Christ, the beauty of our differences, the compliments are so um, much a gift to one another that when we give that away, both in action or even just in, in our inner thoughts, being, you know, captivated by you know, philosophies of this world that, you know, if you feel that you must be it and all those kinds of things, we start to lose sight that the other is really our gift. Mm. And in some of the severest cases, and I believe homosexuality is one of those cases, we commit sexual suicide. We commit gender suicide. And we cut off any opportunity to ever receive the gift that God created, bone of our bone, flesh of our flesh. We turn in on ourselves and we go for the same. Because those unmet relational needs, validation, maybe from our father, maybe from other men or peer groups, become sexualized. And so there's this real perversion in our souls of understanding. And we strive to recreate ourselves and we worship that part of creation to make that whole enough. And I've never met anyone who's ever been whole enough to sustain the counterfeit of what God intended for marriage. And people will argue that, you know, they'll say, we've been together 40, 40 years, but chastity in marriage, having a chaste life, a pure life, is equivalent to having a pure gospel. You know, we have muddy gospels right now in our culture. And, the, you know, a good example of it is gay Christianity. And this whole idea that you can be a gay Christian, you can marry anything with the identity of Christ. 
You know, if that were the case, Nicole and I would have never gotten married. If she would have seen anything competing for my affections other than Christ, there would have been no confidence that she could step into a relationship and have a, a, a oneness. And that's, that's what's so scary, I think, about what's going on in culture and how, you know, the devil, even in these, these years in America and around the world, um, has legitimized gay Christianity using the voice of certain denominations. It grieves me so when I hear that because it's devoid of truth. It's devoid of understanding. You know, and we can have a relationship with folks who are struggling in their identity. That doesn't make it right. But when we listen to their story, we can gain understanding and then forgiveness and then correction. I think sometimes we like to jump to correction because it just makes us uncomfortable. Mm. And we miss those building blocks of relationship that, you know, journeying with them like the church did in Palm Springs, buying my art. You know, when the Lord brought me through this body of Christ there in Palm Springs and opened up his word to me <clears throat> and showed me for the first time a clear gospel. It was an epiphany, even though I'd heard this stuff before. It was clearer to me where the errors were in my own understanding of the character of God, his ability to do exceedingly more than we can think of, his presence to even be there uh, in the hell of my life and never leave me or forsake me. And in the kingdom, you know, um, Revelation says, and they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. They didn't love their life even to death. This would never be a testimony I would ever ask for. And I used to just think when I was younger, Please, God, please, God, please, God, don't let that be my, my story. When it became my story, it was a really difficult journey, but God didn't lead me there. And I think what's so powerful for me is recognizing that when the culture and the church tries to say, God loves you just the way you are, God loved me so much, he wasn't willing to live in me where he found me. And I believe that that's the, that's the whole gospel. A burning question here, though. For you, God was able to transform and change you. You know, we believe what 2 Corinthians says, that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, mm -hmm. the new has come. What about for people who believe scripture, who, you know, feel humble in heart to accept what God has to say about them, but who still feels like this is how I was born. I'm not choosing to have these feelings. This is how I am. Like, what do you right. say to that? Well, you know, yeah, we'll explain in scripture that that's the beauty of dying. You know, one time I was talking to a group of people and I says, well, isn't it interesting? You know, I know that there's this common uh, feeling that I was born this way. Isn't it interesting that our savior that that's why you got to be born again. I don't mean to, uh, to dismiss all those feelings, but when he says that you must be born again, you're born anew, he knew that that fracturing in the garden needed to be reconciled, and that communion was truth, had to be restored. Because Jesus came to testify to the truth. And unless that new heart, that new mind, is received through faith, through repentance, we're not even able to understand the scriptures. You know, it doesn't bother me if someone says I was born this way. You know, now for the Christian, for the person who's been baptized to faith, and they have a lot of the language, they have the understanding, but they have this proclivity that they're just attached to, I would offer this advice, that when we live a life as God norms and guides it by scripture, we continually go back to remembering that there is a drowning of an old life and a resurrection of a new, now and not yet. And in that, everything goes on the table. And when Christ, being a jealous God, who has a covenant with his um, children, this Elkanar, this jealous covenant that he will fight for, we surrender anything that we once identified with that once competed with the nature and the presence of a living God in our life. And so we, we have to recognize that 
scripture doesn't school us and teach us to call ourselves dead Christians. I mean, it sounds interesting, but a gay Christian is it's counterintuitive. An adulterous Christian, you know, those kinds of things are bringing these these grave clothes. Nobody, I think, in their right mind would ever go in to a wedding uh, dressed with grave clothes, especially decaying, disfigured, distorted, stenchy things, right? It's insanity to do that. And it's just as insane for the Christian to marry any of this world's uh, philosophies with the, um, the gospel that transforms and transcends this dying, decaying world. That's really the gospel that no one has to live without hope. And while some of me are um, get married or have children and, you know, and that kind of thing, I have a, an understanding of masculinity today I didn't have before. The true masculine, we see it in Christ, who, in spite of all the persecution and all of the uh, things that uh, were taken from him in this life, in his humiliation, he never gave up on the mission that he was called to do. That's the masculine heart to finish what you've been called to do. The feminine, like in uh, Mary, is that whole sense of receiving. Um, and what a beautiful, amazing gift it is when you become one with a person like my wife, Nicole. She received and trusted what was being given to her. And the fruit of that are our children. And our groom entrusts that gift to us, his bride. Um, it's scary. The two sides of love is being able not only to initiate like Christ, but to receive like Mary. Hmm. And without that whole and relating, we're not experiencing the whole of what God intended for humanity. And for the person who says, well, I'll never marry, I'll never have children, I say this to you. That's no less of a whole enough living when your life is surrendered completely to Christ. We have so much more to talk about, and I thank you yes. for your time. <laughs> I can't wait to start up again with you. Pastor, it's been a pleasure. I look forward to the next time. And I want to thank our listeners, too, for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a review. And don't forget to click the follower subscribe button so you don't miss out on upcoming episodes. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram as Friends for Life LCMS. And finally, listeners, we want to hear from you. Do you have an idea about a guest you'd like to hear from or a topic you want talked about? Email us at friendsforlife at lcms.org. We want to hear from you about what you want to hear about when it comes to issues of life. Thanks for joining us. Friends for Life is a podcast that discusses the life God has given and the people he has called you to serve right where you are in God's mission. 